Chapter Two, Part Two of Genji Monogatari. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Genji Monogatari by Murasaki Shikabu, translated by Suyamatsu Kenchio. Chapter Two, Part Two. He went on accordingly. About that time I knew another lady. She was on the whole a superior kind of person, a fair poetess, a good musician, and a fluent speaker, with good enunciation and graceful in her movements. All these admirable qualities I noticed myself and heard them spoken of by others. As my acquaintance with her commenced at the time when I was not on the best of terms with my former companion, I was glad to enjoy her society. The more I associated with her, the more fascinating she became. Meanwhile, my first friend died, at which I felt truly sorry. Still, I could not help it, and I therefore paid frequent visits to this one. In the course of my attentions to her, however, I discovered many unpleasant traits. She was not very modest, and did not appear to be one whom a man could trust. On this account I became somewhat disappointed, and visited her less often. While matters were on this footing, I accidentally found out that she had another lover, to whom she gave a share of her heart. It happened that one inviting moonlight evening in October, I was driving out from home on my way to a certain Danagon. On the road I met with a young noble who was going in the same direction. We therefore drove together, and as we were journeying on, he told me that someone might be waiting for him and he was anxious to see her. Well, by and by we arrived at the house of my lady love. The bright reflection of the waters of an ornamental lake was seen through crevices in the walls, and the pale moon, as she shed her full radiance over the shimmering waves, seemed to be charmed with the beauty of the scene. It would have been heartless to pass by with indifference, and we both descended from the carriage without knowing each other's intention. This youth seems to have been the other one. He was rather shy. He sat down on a mat of reeds that was spread beside a corridor near the gateway, and gazing up at the sky, meditated for some moments in silence. The chrysanthemums in the gardens were in full bloom, whose sweet perfume soothed us with its gentle influence, and round about us the scarlet leaves of the maple were falling, as ever and anon they were shaken by the breeze. The scene was altogether romantic. Presently he took a flute out of his bosom and played. He then whispered, Its shade is refreshing. In a few minutes the fair one struck up responsively on a sweet tone wagon, a species of cotto. The melody was soft and exquisite in charming strains of modern music and admirably adapted to the lovely evening. No wonder that he was fascinated. He advanced towards the casement from which the sounds proceeded, and glancing at the leaves scattered on the ground, whispered in invidious tones, Sure no strange footsteps would ever dare to press these leaves. He then culled a chrysanthemum humming as he did so. Even this spot so fair to view, with moon and koto's gentle strain, could make no other lover true as me, thy fond, thy only swain. Wretched, he exclaimed, alluding to his poetry, and then added, One tune more. Stay not your hand when one is near, who so ardently longs to hear you. Thus he began to flatter the lady, who, having heard his whispers, replied thus in a tender, hesitating voice. Sorry I am, my voice too low, to match thy flute's far sweeter sound, which mingles with the winds that blow the autumn leaves upon the ground. Ah, she little thought I was a silent and vexed spectator of all this flirtation. She then took up a so, another kind of cotto, with thirteen strings, and tuned it to a banjiki ki, a winter tune. 
and played on it still more excellently. Though an admirer of music, I cannot say that these bewitching melodies gave me any pleasure under the peculiar circumstances I stood in. Now romantic interludes such as this might be pleasant enough in the case of maidens who are kept strictly in court service, and whom we have very little opportunity of meeting with, but even there we should hesitate to make such a one our life companion. How much less could one ever entertain such an idea in a case like my own, making therefore that evening's experience a ground of dissatisfaction, I never saw her more. Now, gentlemen, let us take into consideration these two instances which have occurred to myself, and see how equally unsatisfactory they are. The one too jealous, the other too forward. Thus, early in life, I found out how little reliance was to be placed on such characters. And now I think so still more. This opinion applies more especially to the latter of the two. Dewdrops on the huggy flower of beauty so delicate that they disappear as soon as we touch them. Hailstones on the bamboo grass that melt in our hand as soon as we prick them appear at a distance extremely tempting and attractive. Take my humble advice, however, and go not near them. If you do not appreciate this advice now, the lapse of another seven years will render you well able to understand that such adventures will only bring a tarnished fame. Thus Sami no Kami admonished them, and Tono Chiuchio nodded as usual. Genji slightly smiled, Perhaps he thought it was all very true, and he said, Your twofold experience was indeed disastrous and irritating. Now, said Tono Jiuchio, I will tell you a story concerning myself. It was the evil fortune of Sama no Kami to meet with too much jealousy in one of the ladies to whom he might otherwise have given his heart, while he could feel no confidence in another owing to flirtations. It was my hard lot to encounter an instance of excessive diffidence. I once knew a girl whose person was altogether pleasing, and although I too had no intention, as Sama no Kami said, of forming an everlasting connection with her, I nevertheless took a great fancy to her. As our acquaintance was prolonged, our mutual affection grew warmer. My thoughts were always of her and she placed entire confidence in me. Now, when complete confidence is placed by one person in another, does not nature teach us to expect resentment when that confidence is abused? No such resentment, however, seemed under any circumstances to trouble her. When I very seldom visited her, she showed no excitement or indignation, but behaved and looked as if we had never been separated from each other. This patient silence was more trying to me than reproaches. She was parentless and friendless. For this reason, responsibility weighed more heavily on me. Abusing her gentle nature, however, I frequently neglected her. About this time, moreover, a certain person who lived near her discovered our friendship and frightened her by sending, through some channel, mischief-making messages to her. This I did not become aware of till afterwards, and it seemed she was quite cast down and helpless. She had a little one for whose sake it appears she was additionally sad. One day I unexpectedly received a bunch of nadeshiko flowers. They were from her. At this point Tono Chiuchio became gloomy, and what, inquired Genji, were the words of her message? Sir, nothing but the verse. Forgot may be the lowly bed from which these darling flowerets spring. Still let a kindly dew be shed upon their early nurturing. No sooner had I read this than I went to her at once. She was gentle and sedate as usual, but evidently absent and preoccupied. Her eyes rested on the dew lying on the grass in the garden, and her ears were intent upon the melancholy singing of the autumn insects. It was as if we were in a real romance. I said to her, 
when with confused gaze we view the mingled flowers on gay parterre amid their blooms of radiant hue the toconuts my love is there and avoiding all allusion to the nadashiko flowers i repeatedly endeavoured to comfort the mother's heart she murmured in reply a flower already bent with dew the winds of autumn cold and chill will wither all thy beauteous hue and soon alas unpitying kill thus she spoke sadly but she reproached me no further the tears came involuntarily into her eyes she was however apparently sorry for this and tried to conceal them on the whole she behaved as if she meant to show that she was quite accustomed to such sorrows i certainly deeply sympathised with her yet still further abusing her patience i did not visit her again for some time but i was punished when i did so she had flown leaving no traces behind her if she is still living she must needs be passing a miserable existence now if she had been free from this excessive diffidence this apathy of calmness if she had complained when it was necessary with becoming warmth and spirit she need never have been a wanderer and i would never have abused her confidence but as i said before a woman who has no strength of emotion no passionate bursts of sorrow or of joy can never retain a dominion over us i loved this woman without understanding her nature and i am constantly but in vain trying to find her and her little darling who was also very lovely and often i think with grief and pain that though i may succeed in forgetting her she may possibly not be able to forget me and surely there must be many an evening when she is disquieted by sad memories of the past let us now sum up our experiences and reflect on the lessons which they teach us one who bites your finger will easily estrange your affection by her violence falseness and forwardness will be the reproach of some other in spite of her melodious music and the sweetness of her songs a third too self-contained and too gentle is open to the charge of a cold silence which oppresses one and cannot be understood whom then are we to choose all this variety and this perplexing difficulty of choice seems to be the common lot of humanity where again i say are we to go to find the one who will realize our desires shall we fix our aspirations on the beautiful goddess the heavenly kichijio ah this would be but superstitious and impracticable so mournfully finished to no Jiuchio, and all his companions who had been attentively listening burst simultaneously into laughter at his last allusion and now shikabe it is your turn tell us your story exclaimed to no Jiuchio, turning to him what worth hearing can your humble servant tell you go on be quick don't be shy let us hear shikub no chio after a little meditation thus began when i was a student at the university i met there with a woman of very unusual intelligence she was in every respect one with whom as sama no kami has said you could discuss affairs both public and private her dashing genius and eloquence were such that all ordinary scholars would find themselves unable to cope with her and would be at once reduced to silence now my story is as follows i was taking lessons from a certain professor who had several daughters and she was one of them it happened by some chance or other i fell much into her society the professor who noticed this once took up a wine-glass in his hand and said to me hear what i sing about two choices this was a plain offer put before me and thenceforward i endeavoured for the sake of his tuition to make myself as agreeable as possible to his daughter i tell you frankly however that i had no particular affection for her though she seemed already to regard me as her victim 
She seized every opportunity of pointing out to me the way in which we should have to steer, both in public and private life. When she wrote to me, she never employed the effeminate style of the kana, but wrote, oh, so magnificently. The great interest which she took in me induced me to pay frequent visits to her, and by making her my tutor I learned how to compose ordinary Chinese poems. However, though I do not forget all these benefits, and though it is no doubt true that our wife or daughter should not lack intelligence, yet for the life of me I cannot bring myself to approve of a woman like this. And still less likely is it that such could be of any use to the wives of high personages like yourselves. Give me a lovable nature in lieu of sharpness. I quite agree with Sama no Kami on this point. "'What an interesting woman she must have been!' exclaimed Tono Chiuchio, with the intention of making Shikup go on with his story. This he fully understood, and making a grimace, he thus proceeded. "'Once when I went to her after a long absence, a way we all have, you know, she did not receive me openly as usual, but spoke to me from behind a screen.' I surmised that this arose from chagrin at my negligence, and I intended to avail myself of this opportunity to break with her. But the sagacious woman was a woman of the world, and not like those who easily lose their temper or keep silence about their grief. She was quite as open and frank as Sama no Kami would approve of. She told me in a low, clear voice, I am suffering from heartburn, and I cannot therefore see you face to face. Yet if you have anything important to say to me, I will listen to you. This was, no doubt, a plain truth, but what answer could I give to such a terribly frank avowal? Thank you, said I simply, and I was just on the point of leaving, when relenting perhaps a little, she said aloud, Come again soon, and I shall be all right. To pass this unnoticed would have been impolite, yet I did not like to remain there any longer, especially under such circumstances. So, looking askance, I said, Here I am, then why excuse me? Is my visit all in vain? And my consolation is, you tell me, come again? No sooner had I said this than she dashed out as follows with a brilliancy of repartee which became a woman of her genius. If we fond lovers were, and meeting every night, I should not be ashamed were it even in the light. Nonsense, nonsense, cried Genji and the others, who either were or pretended to be quite shocked. Where can there be such a woman as that? She must have been a devil. Fearful, fearful. And snapping their fingers with disapproving glances, they said, Do tell us something better. Do give us a better story than that. Shikub no Jio, however, quietly remarked, I have nothing else to relate, and remained silent. Hereupon a conversation took place to the following effect. It is characteristic of thoughtless people, and that, without distinction of sex, that they try to show off their small accomplishments. This is in the highest degree unpleasant, as for ladies, it may not indeed be necessary to be thorough master of the three great histories and the five classical texts, yet they ought not to be destitute of some knowledge of both public and private affairs, and this knowledge can be imperceptibly acquired without any regular study of them, which, though superficial, will yet be amply sufficient to enable them to talk pleasantly about them with their friends." but how contemptible would they seem if this made them vain of it? The mana style and pedantic phrases were not meant for them, and if they use them the public will only say, would that they would remember that they are women and not men, and they would only incur the reproach of being pedants, as many ladies, especially among the aristocracy, do. Again, while they should not be altogether unversed in poetical compositions, they should never be slaves to them, or allow themselves to be betrayed into using strange quotations, the only consequence of which would be that they would appear to be bold when they ought to be reserved, and abstracted when very likely they have practical duties to attend to. 
How utterly inappropriate, for instance, it would be on the May festival, if, while the attention of all present was concentrated on the solemnity of the occasion, the thoughts of these ladies were wandering on their own poetical imaginations about sweet flags. Or if again, on the Ninth Day Festival, when all the nobles present were exercising their inventive faculties on the subject of Chinese poems, they were to volunteer to pour forth their grand ideas on the dew-laid flowers of the chrysanthemum, thus endeavouring to rival their opponents of the stronger sex. There is a time for everything, and all people, but more especially women, should be constantly careful to watch circumstances, and not to air their accomplishments at a time when nobody cares for them. They should practice a sparing economy in displaying their learning and eloquence, and should even, if circumstances require, plead ignorance on subjects with which they are familiar. As to Genji, even these last observations seemed only to encourage his reverie still to run upon a certain one, whom he considered to be the happy medium between the too much and the too little, and no definite conclusion having been arrived at through the conversation, the evening passed away. End of chapter 2, part 2